This is SciBite, episode 89, for April 9th, 2013. everyone and welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science and information podcast, which is live Tuesdays over at jblive.tv and fresh Wednesday mornings for download over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. So uh, what are we talking about today? Today, we're going to take a look at the hint of dark matter. Reading your dreams, black hole snacks, spacecraft updates, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back in history and up in the sky this week. I heard several things in there that are relevant to my interest, Heather, so what do you say? Let's kick it off with the news. All right, what are we covering in the news segment? All righty. After about two years of readings, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is a a cosmic detector on the space station, has actually found the first possible evidence of the cosmic footprints that may have been left by dark matter. Oh, so this is what this uh, this thing was up there listening for the for the signs, right? Because I guess they can't observe it directly. Is that true, or they don't have the ability to yet? (laughs) It's not so much directly. Okay. So We're looking the, for like the footprints. All right. We've seen, you like, know, animals. Like when go, I'm looking for Bigfoot. Well, maybe not Bigfoot. Oh. But because it's there. We're pretty sure it's there. Oh, okay. It's like an animal tromping through the forest. You're just looking for its footprints. That's we cool. think we may have actually found some now. That's awesome. So, uh, dark matter, you know, uh, hy- type of matter kind of hypothesized, it takes a little over a quarter percent of the mass of the universe. And it's, we call it that because we look at, the mass of galaxies and other large scale structures. And according to the physics, there needs to be more mass there in order for everything to act the way we see it acts. So about 80 years ago, they said, hey, we think there's something that mass there that we can't actually see. Hmm. And it's not dark matter because it's black. That's dust. We can see du- mm, dust. Mm. This is dark matter because we can't see it. It's just. We can't see it by regular instrumentation means. So kind of figuring that out and unraveling the whole thing can get us a lot better idea of the composition of the universe, what exactly holds galaxies together, because what we see doesn't exactly connect all the dots that we need it to. Oh, really? Yeah. (laughs) So they put this instrument up, and it is a seven-ton detector with about a three-foot magnetic ring. Hmm. They sent it up in 2011, and it's sending its data to CERN, the uh, you know, the big uh, yeah. collider in Europe. Right. That didn't have faster than light neutrinos, but we did have Higgs boson particles. So they're getting all the data from this, and it's measured over like 30 billion with a B mm. cosmic rays. Oh. And so they take this magnet, and they have. Very precise. They can do particle detectors that sort of collect and identify all these cosmic rays that are passing through it. Now, on the it's a long mis- duration mission thing, so it's recorded. You know, all of these, you know, sixteen billion cosmic rays a year. They transmit all the data to Earth, and they, you know, analyze it there. So the data itself, now. The number of positrons is identified. So it says, I see over 400,000 of these, which is the largest matter number of these antimatter particles. Actually, you know, antimatter for electrons. Hmm. Uh, So, you know, these positrons, opposite, you know, antimatter electrons. We're measuring those. And, you know, they had a whole bunch of those in the first 18 months of data. So now we have 6.8 million of these that are, yes, we know they are electrons. We know they're the antimatter particles, counterparts, positrons. 
So if we look at these in dark matter, if when part, should I say, when particles of dark matter crash together, they sort of annihilate each other. Mm. And then that leaves the, you know, that should leave what we're calling the footprint, which is positrons and the antimatter version, so electrons. So you should have these pairs. Every time dark matter, you know, crashes together, then we should have this pair of electron positron. Okay. So what we needed, what we're trying to look for is that. But those types of pairings could also come from just pulsars. These type of stars that rotate with, um, you know, they're pumping out a great deal of energy, mm. like a lighthouse, essentially. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. They rotate. Yeah, very much. <laughs> so they're giant star lighthouses. So we can also get those kind of pairings from those stars. But it's the different energies and this they have very specific behaviors. So if we look at exactly the ratio between them and how they, you know, bend in certain um, in certain ways, then we can say, yes, this is more like a pulsar. No, this is more like what we would expect with dark matter. So they have to plot out this curve of mm. you know, the ratios between them. And if the curve is one shape, then it's dark matter. If it's another, it's pulsars. What I kind of find interesting is this thing just kind of sits up there, attached yep. now to the uh, International Space Station, and it's just, yep. it's just essentially passively collecting uh, this data. It's not like it's, <laughs> it's not like there's something about it that draws uh, these particles in. It's not like it has a <laughs> vacuum feature, which or magnetic, you know, attraction to it. It's just very <laughs> much. Um, Sitting there and just catching stuff as it f um, flies by, I guess. Yeah, and so, so it could be anywhere. Sensor, you know, motion capture camera for, uh, you know, positrons and electrons. So it's just anytime they see one fly by, then it's, hey, take a picture. Look at the characteristics of what's there. Take all the data, beam it down to Earth and let the crazy scientists look at it at CERN. I mean, I know it's $2 billion, and you, it needs to be attached to something, but if they threw another one up on a satellite, mm -hmm. I mean, they could, they could collect the same da data even faster, right? I mean, it seems like that'd be... Uh, um, uh, twice it, the data, twice the fun? Yeah, I mean, I realize it's more money, but it seems like yeah. it, it doesn't require anything all that special. It's not like it requires this sweet spot to be in. It could just be up no. there. They have these particle detectors here on Earth. They just yeah. don't work as well. Yeah, They're not getting the amount of data that the you know, that the AMS does in right. space, on the right. space station. Right. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, I guess it's funny because they're always, they're always guarded with how they say things, but it's, so it's, we haven't confirmed dark matter, but we've concern, we've confirmed the, the, you call it footprints, other people are calling it, uh, signals, right? I mean, w yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that's like as close as we're probably going to get for a while. Uh, yeah, we've seen, let's see how to, it's like uh, we've seen those photo motion sensor photo boxes, you know, where we've talked to it a couple of times in the past where it's like, hey, we actually see this type of rhino that it's really rare or this cat. And we know exactly where it's traveling to. So this is like one of those. And it's so we get data that, hey, there was something there running past the camera. Now, it'll take a little bit longer for me to say it is this type of cat versus it is that kind of fox or, you know, you're narrowing down what exactly is there. So we can say, hey, we have two months worth of data. It it all looks like a cat. <laughs> now, whether it's this kind of cat or that kind of cat, that's the question. So it's yeah, Schrodinger's <laughs> cat. We won't know until we know. <laughs> hmm. So it's kind of a drum roll until you can go through the data and specifically say, you know, it has these kind of spots. It has those kind of spots. And so really get the details of what it's actually doing what the ratios are, and then we can say, okay, yes, this is dark matter. Right, or yeah. no sad face, it's just a pulsar. We need to keep looking for it. Right, right. Which either way, you'll let us know, right, Heather? Oh, yes. You'll keep the Cybite crew informed. All right. Well, then let's take a, a pause before we go to the next story. Heather has a very relevant pick 
for your interest this week. Now, you know about this, right? Of course, we have uh, the affiliate system here at Jupiter Broadcasting where we have links at the very bottom of the Jupiter. You know, I'm just going to bring it up right now. Watch, I'm going to go to jupiterbroadcasting.com. And if you were at this Jupiter Broadcasting website and you scrolled all the way down to the very bottom of our website, boom, down there you'd find links for Amazon US, UK, Amazon DE, the eBay, the Netflix, the New Egg, the Think Geek, the Best Buy, Mint.com, Audible, which, man, we got. I should make some Audible picks because I have had some great Audible books recently. Uh, Code School, which is great, a great way to learn by doing. And then we have browsers extensions right now for Chrome and Firefox and some more coming soon. And those will automatically tag your shopping session so you don't have to think about it. But let's say you're over there. Let's say you're over at that Amazon or maybe you're in our show notes and you see the link for this. Yeah. Think about this. We just got done talking about dark matter. Maybe you want to learn a little more, right, Heather? Is this going to teach me a little more? Yes. And it's not so much a textbook. I really liked this one because it's it's more talking about the history. It's kind of a, a story. The story of, so you can kind of see, you know, it says, hey, back at this time we were looking and, hmm, there's a question. Why are the galaxies acting this way? <laughs> and yeah. it kind of, it more tells the story and kind of teaches you that, which I really find it's more, in, to me, it's more important to kind of realize the kind of overall idea of what's going on, whether, you, whether there's math involved or specific things going on. Yeah, that's great. But if you can really get the overall idea and kind of see where it came from, then you'll have a pretty good idea of what exactly is going on with it. So the 4% universe, dark matter, dark energy, and the race to discover the rest of reality. Ooh, I mean, that's that's about as real as it gets because yep. that's the race to discover reality. All right, very cool. We will have that link in the show notes. And if you grab that or anything else when you're shopping over to Amazon, after you use that link. You will support the SciBite program, the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, and all of those wonderful things. And it's been great uh, because a lot of times the affiliate revenues match our bandwidth costs as the audience sort of grows. They sort of naturally switch over and help us out with that stuff. So we always really appreciate that when you can do that. All right, Heather, well, uh, with the uh, with the picks filed, why don't we move on? And uh, without further ado, let me bring the band in here because it's time Come on, guys. for the news fight. Yeah, I see how it is. If I ask them to come in here, they're like, yeah, we're getting to it, Chris. But when when you call them in, boom, they're over here faster than I know what to do with. It's ridiculous. I have cookies. Don't feel bad. Oh, I so, bribe them with cookies. You're so clever. You're so clever. All right. Well, <laughs> this next story is uh, one of these that when you wake up in the middle of the night, you're like, God, what was I just dreaming about? Wouldn't, wouldn't you have loved to have been able to record that session? Well, maybe we're getting oh, closer, so, right? Oh, so very much. Because sometimes <laughs> I remember I had dreams and I'm like... I could make a great movie out of that. Or, or sometimes, only... like, I've, I've had show ideas that I forget immediately. Yes. Yeah. You're like, no, Dream, what did you do? But now they've actually had a recent study that say it's, that's indicating it's possible to look at brain activity patterns and understand or be able to kind of guess what a person is actually dreaming about. So uh, they took what? In... <laughs> yes. So they took in three... Uh, adult male volunteers. Okay. And they're not going into REM sleep, you know, the really deep yeah. sleep. The good stuff. Rapid eye movement. Yeah. yeah. They let them sleep and it's this kind of dreaming that happens right away. Yeah. The the, the one where uh, you can you can kind of like, you're kind of phasing in and out of the real world and the sleep world. Kind of. So they let okay. them fall asleep just a little bit and then they woke them up immediately. Okay. Well, it certainly helps because it takes, you know, an hour to reach REM sleep. Then it'd be difficult to have them fall asleep and get up and wait. So they did it where it's, you know, a short period of time. So they pulled them on. They're reading their brain waves, you know, for the polysomnograms. And then they wake them up and say, what did you see? Oh, wow. Give me a detailed report. You see you know, a ball and a door and a girl. Okay. And so then they go through and they gathered a little over 200 of these reports from these guys and they had this database where they said this little squiggle of the brain means there was a door this one went there was a ball and so they were able to make this database of all this of all these so then they were able to use it use the functional mri which is you know as your brain is thinking it goes through it's not just taking a snapshot it's taking you know video of what your brain is doing mm. And the polysomnography, so that you can actually record everything that's going on. So then they were able to say, 
okay, we see what all these data are. You know, the data is at night. Now look at it during the day. You know, look at. Oh, interesting. Here is a ball. Here is a door. So you can kind of really make sure that thing, they match up. Right. Then they could go through and say, all right, now dream and don't tell us. And we're going to guess. <laughs> and the algorithm actually could sort through it all. And it was actually picking up like specific objects like 70% of the time. Now, it's not saying you dreamed that you walked down the road and you had a great idea for TechSnap and it was awesome. <laughs> and it was going to bring you all the money and joy in the world. Right. No, what it could do is say road, ball, because there was a kid that tossed a ball and hit, hit your head, which made you wake up. So that's the kind of things, very, very basic. Hmm. Now it's still pretty. All- so that that um, that that uh, visualization slideshow they had. That's the system just matching it with a, with an image. Kind of yes. Yeah. There's they you know they get all this brainwave activity and they're trying to pull out you know specific patterns. They say, hey, this pattern is this. This pattern is that. I would like to find. <clears throat> I would love to hear a study on how the brain processes like the speed of dreams like it's i always find it fascinating when i wake up and it feels like i've been dreaming i've been doing some I, I, like i've experienced an entire day have you ever had one of those where you've like you've lived a day in your dream yes. and then you wake up and you're like wait a minute that didn't wow all of that was just within a few hours that's incredible or whatever oh, it is oh i got myself in trouble in high school it was you know a day b day i went to sleep i dreamt the whole a day yeah got up Went to school, did yeah. my homework, came back. Woke up the next morning, took all my books for the wrong day. Oh. And then I was like, what do you mean? What happened yesterday? You- <laughs> so I, then I had like <laughs> hang my head and go to my teacher. I'm like, my homework is at home because I turned it in in my sleep last night. I promised I did. I think it's just fascinating how the brain is able to obviously replay and, and com- decompress a bunch of stuff very, very fast and make, you know, very long times I feel very long when they actually happen very quickly, but I I know you know that whole like where you really experience something. I've I've when I was in when I was in high school, Heather, the number one thing I would do is I would sleep. I would I would sleep, wake. I would like I would wake up, but I'm asleep. But I'd be dreaming that I'm awake. I turn off my alarm. I pick out my clothes. I jump in the shower. I eat breakfast. All of this, and then I would wake up like an hour later and be massively late. <laughs> So yes. I'd love to just, I, you know, all this science stuff with the dreams is really something because, yeah, A, it's just great to see kind of get ideas what maybe some of these patterns mean and all that kind of stuff. But anything we can do just to kind of continue to figure this process out because it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. And it also like don't feel bad because they actually prove that like the vividness of your dreams, no matter how fantastic, which mine are really fantastical and crazy, sometimes it's as real as waking life from the brain's perspective. Yeah. You know, until I was an adult, I had only dreamt one person from the real world. I had dreamt no real world places. And it was, you know, all these crazy things. And in the dream, I knew the history of that world. And yeah. I was there. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's kind of what they're saying is no matter how fantastic or crazy, unless you're, you know, lucid dreaming, like, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, you could, some people can do, but you're which means that you're aware that you're actually dreaming. Right. And you can kind of control it. And then you get your own holodeck, and that's totally unfair. Yeah. But because the visual um, brainwaves that are kicking off really looked the same as those when the person was awake. Hmm. You know, so they looked at the red ball, and that was the similar, almost the same brainwave activity than when they had, when they dreamt of the red ball. But it all, but they also found that the particular neurotransmitters in the brain that are involved with memory aren't really active during sleep, which is why if you wake oh. up a few minutes, right, and you can't yes. really remember your dreams. Right. Like the first five minutes, you're like, I remember everything, and then you're eating breakfast, you're like, What did I dream about? So I guess that would imply then that the imaging functionality there, when we're when we you know when we when we picture a, a red ball in our minds. Mm-hmm. That isn't necessarily maybe a function of memory or at least of the long-term memory. 
uh, you know, when you think about it, like when you when you walk into your room and you look down and you see there's a cup on the table, you don't actually stop and look at that cup and look at all of the different aspects of the glass and how much water's in there and all that. You I mean you really what your mind does is you, you create a basic snapshot of the room and you say, okay, there's a cup there, and it stores the concept of a cup on the concept of a table, and that's mm-hmm. why you're able to reconstruct it in a dream so vividly because essentially that's what you're doing when you're walking around during the day. You just do it differently, and so it to me, I've always wondered, is that a function of memory or is that some sort of just like imaging projection system that our mind has to keep a running inventory of what's going on. And it sounds more like it's not so much a function of memory, potentially, from what they're saying here. More specifically in dreams, just because during the time where you're asleep and dreaming, the parts with memory where it's shuffling things about, you know, into the memory storage units, (laughs) they're they're asleep. The databanks. Yeah, those those, uh, cables to those databanks are more asleep than you are. Hard drives are spun down. Definitely strung down. There is nothing going across the USB <laughs> co- cable unplugged, wow. laying on the floor. Wow. So. Sounds brutal, actually. So that's why generally, you know, so maybe it's more like the USB is sort of un- half unplugged. So some of the data gets through. Okay. You're like, I think I remember some of that. Yeah. yeah. And then not so much anymore. Yeah. Yep. And the longer you wait to try to remember, the quicker it fades. So if you really want to remember a dream, you got to write it down right then and there because that's when it's yes. going to be the sharpest. Yep. And get stored in that long term data bank. All right, Heather, well, the band's still here. So why don't we move on to the two byte news? Go! That's hot, bud. <laughs> hey! oh, <clears throat> You're trying to get in here with him now. No, oh, I well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get friendly. I, I figure okay. I, I, I got to do something. I don't have cookies. Yeah, well, you know. All right, so it's in the Dubai news. All right, we've actually seen a black hole snacking on a planet. Yes, awesome. I think um, we've talked about like a, we've actually been able to see a black hole sort of eating something as it goes along, but this time we've actually been able to see a planet as it was eating, eaten by a black hole. This black hole has actually been inactive for decades we haven't really seen any activity from it Hmm. one might think you know it's a black hole it's forever eating everything right i always did yeah but there's this point where there's the black hole in you know picture you know the black hole spot and everything is coming in but it gets what they call this accretion disc where it's this magical point where the forces are sort of balanced out so that it's almost like a donut then. Like picture your donut on the on the table, don't eat it quite yet. And then, you know, the black hole's right in the center. So there's this kind of ring of ring of, you know, mass and dust and particles and such that's kind of there until something kind of triggers it off. And then it starts, you know, passing within that space. So this was a probably a rogue planet, maybe a brown dwarf you know, really small star. But as it passed too close, then it was, you know, eaten. It got snagged. Yep. Now, <clears throat> it was kind of interesting because they weren't looking at this at all. It's been dormant, so they had it wasn't really interesting to them. They were actually looking at a different galaxy when suddenly they noticed this bright X-ray flare from a different location. They're like, hey, wait a minute. Something weird went on over there. Let's check it out. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you saying we're watching this planet get eaten in another galaxy? Yes. Wow. So it's probably not quite as cool what they're seeing in the visuals that we get. Well, somewhat. They were able to look at it and, you know, have see that you know, the black hole probably had a mass of about, you know, 300,000 suns. So they know this planet and they know it's a roughly size. And they saw this halo of material around it as it was being eaten that was 14 to 30 Jupiters. So that kind of puts it in the range of, you know, what they call the super Jupiters, which is the really big planets, or possibly a brown dwarf, which is sort of a a really small star that can't really, that hasn't really kick-started. The super Jupiter. I like that. Yes. That's nice. Now, if it was a super Jupiter, it was what they call the wandering planet. That's talked about it sometimes where it's the idea that 
you know, as a solar system is forming, sometimes planets come a little too close mm. and they get flung off into space. Now, those planets don't just disappear. They keep flying. So that's what they call these wandering planets. That's just so wild to me. And we've actually seen some. I think um, 2025, we've actually been able to see. So we know they exist. And there is a, there are some estimates that say there could be more of those than there are stars. Well, because if we've seen a lot of that sounds impossible to me, Heather. Well, a lot of these stars have planets. And when they have planets, they have multiple planets. Okay, so maybe you all right. Kick out, you point. kick out one or two planets. Yeah. So if somebody kicks out two planets, now there's two planets and one star. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. So there's you know, a much higher chance that <clears throat> these things are being flung off. <laughs> Watch out. You might get hit by a planet. Yeah, so... That's something else to worry about as you're flying through space in your spaceship that doesn't exist in between stars. It would be so creepy. It would be like a zombie planet with, you know, just dark. Yeah. Creepy. Yeah. Great sci-fi movie, uh, bad guy hangout place, right? Like, <laughs> right on a rogue planet that's hurtling through the yeah. galaxy with yeah. no sunlight. That would be pretty good. I think. Now, not only were they able to see that, they were actually able to take data from it, the emission data. So they could see exactly what it was sort of made of. So they kind of estimate that it didn't eat the whole thing. Wow. It took about 10% of its mass. And so it took a lot out, uh, you know, some of the fluffy outer atmosphere. And it has a denser core that's still there. And it sort of brightened and dimmed over the course of a year. And able to see it kind of, you know, it brightened and then it, it dimmed. And it brightened and it dimmed, which would be, you know, indicative of... You know, it's sucking up some of the atmosphere, and it's not doing it at the very same rate. It's sort of pulling it off in, you know, chunks and drizzles, and, oh, here's another chunk. So we can kind of see that, yes, here's all the material from that's being eaten from this as it, you know, as it continues to snack on all the <laughs> material that they're able to get. Right. <laughs> it just blows me away. They're watching this from another galaxy. See, that's incredible. <clears throat> very cool, Heather. That's a good one. Should we uh, jump into the viewer feedback? Let's go. There we go. See, I had this little light here, and it says yeah. somebody had something they want to send into us. So what do we got here in the viewer feedback? All right. Paul Hill on Twitter actually kind of uh, tagged a story, which you can do too. Not, you don't have to only ask questions. You can say, hey, this story looks really cool. And it was about there is uh, Jupiter... One of Jupiter's planets, Euro uh, moons, should I say, Europa, yeah. has actually got some uh, mission funding. What does that mean? Like so we're going to go through there? And the House and the Senate you know, kind of outlines, put aside some specific funding for saying, okay, you could start planning. Not necessarily start making, but sort of start planning and getting all the data together and sort of drawing up the sheets to get do a Jupiter Europa mission. This is the moon that has, you know, the icy crust and there's an ocean underneath. There's a saltwater ocean underneath it. So they said, yes, you can start planning a mission to there. Because they're like, this is, okay, so this is like, uh, there, mu there must be some funding that happens just to be able to do this, I guess, right? Like yeah. to, to get a team and all that. Yeah, you need, I mean, there's a long distance, sort of a big lead up to any of these big missions. Mm -hmm, yeah. You need to get together. You need to say all right, what kind of stuff do we want to look at? All right, here's the kind of instruments we would need. How do we put them all together? No way, I want this data, you want that data. So there's a lot of different things that go in to say what exactly it's going to do and where it's going to go and how it's going to do it. Do we want to land? Do we want to try to, you know, melt our way through the ice to get to the <laughs> ocean underneath? Oh, yeah, right. <clears throat> What's down there? What's living down there? Yes, yeah, so... Probably just a little civilization. Yeah, and there's, you know, data recently that says, you know, they've been able to see this uh, magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt on the surface, which, mm. that, which also kind of proves that we know there's a salty ocean underneath. And so the ice is not just sitting there doing nothing. It's sort of rotating and it's actually sort of moving, should I say, a conveyor belt, you know, of ice going on. Right. So you can actually see that. And we've been able to see some 
hydrogen peroxide across the surface. Now it's like 20 times more dilute than the stuff you pick off the shelf to, uh, you know, off the grocery or whatever. To put on your onion rings? Talking hydrogen like peroxide? No. Oh, oh, I thought you about salt. No, this is hydrogen peroxide. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, clean woods. Yeah. Clean wounds and such. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Science does not approve using hydrogen peroxide on your food. No. Not at all. But salt, I mean, you know, in moderation. Yeah, in moderation, yeah, okay. But the hydrogen peroxide itself is, we've been able to see that. Um, and from that data, we're able to see that it's new data. We're able to see that it's widespread across much of the surface. And so we can see where it's high concentrations and where it's low concentrations. Hmm. And that's important because the habit, for habitability, you need a liquid water ocean. So it actually, this hydrogen peroxide can decay into oxygen when mixed in liquid water. So we know there's salty ocean underneath there. We see hydrogen peroxide, which means if the hydrogen peroxide gets into the water, then that has oxygen. So now you're oxygenating the water. So, and it could help produce some energy. So now you have the salt water, you have a little bit of energy, you have oxygen, oxygenated water. So now it's looking more and more like, hey, that would be a nifty place for, you know, floating goo and or some sort of swimmers and some sort of little tiny bacteria. Hmm. Just uh, something real small you'd have to go there to see. Yes. And right. that's one of the big things of, you know, if we do a mission to there, there's a big question as to if you land something on the surface of the ice maybe you have a little um you know nuclear a uh, little tiny nuclear uh, heating source and melt your way down through the ice Ooh. and then check out what's underneath there mm. and why not why not include a laser too if you're gonna maybe. if you're gonna throw a reactor on there you might as well toss in a laser and maybe uh -huh. some rockets no, that's on Mars. I know, I know, but it seems to be just the standard equipment now that we give all of our reactor, uh, our all of our robots in space now. So just saying, <laughs> they all get rocket pots yeah. and yeah. lasers, even though they might not be useful. Yeah, well, it's just in case. Just it's like I, I don't know. You know everybody what. walking out the door gets a party gift. <laughs> yeah. Here's your party gift. Well, okay. If you'd like to uh, get your question to the show, you can uh, contact Heather on Twitter. She's at JB underscore Mars underscore base. You can send her a link that way, or you can email the show, SciBite, at jupiterbroadcasting.com, or even easier yet, there's a contact link at the top of our website. You click that, and then choose SciBite from the drop-down list, and our robots that have lasers and jetpacks <laughs> will make sure it gets to the right place. Uh, Heather, should we do a little spacecraft update? Let's go. Thank you, Mr. Chekhov. So, Mr. Chekhov uh, tells me we have a little SpaceX uh, update. We do. Back in March, we talked about how there was a little bit of a glitch in the uh, when they blasted off. All right, with yeah, one was, of the uh, rockets, or yeah, yeah, the yeah, where one it was thrusters. three of yeah the thrusters, where three of them didn't quite fire, and they were having trouble getting into a proper orbit, and mm -hmm. things were kind of touch and go for a brief moment, a mm -hmm. few moments there. So they've been able to look back and kind of see what happened. Now, it was the oxidizer pressure was low in three of the tanks. And that was that is required to orbit the craft for communication and getting it to the you know, proper orbit so they can bring it to the space station. Now, the problem came in when three of those, they had some small little design change that the supplier had made. They oh, need no a magnifying way. glass to see. Oh, my gosh. And that caused them to get stuck and you know they'd gone through and they'd made the low pressure system test and they're like everything passes good job let's get it in there mm -hmm. they didn't do the high level pressure test because everything had been going fine mm -hmm. and now of course now they go yes everything gets low and high everything gets triple checked have no fear we're not going to be that silly again or not make that assumption that everything is okay uh, yeah yeah now at that time, they're able to go through and write some new software in real time. So it's, you know, it's up. Three of them haven't, you know, three of the check valves are stuck. A check valve is where gas can pass through one way, but it can't come back. It uh. needs a specific amount of pressure 
to open it up. So three of them were stuck. And so while they're stuck, Mm -hmm. everyone goes through and writes some software to say, all right, build the pressure up on the other side of the valve. So it sort of releases the pressure and kind of triggers everything to get to kind of open in the right way. Wow, that's that sounds like a Scotty solution there. Yeah, but because they were supposed to use to ang- to get things for communication, they also were having trouble communicating with it. Oh. While it was in orbit. So they're actually able to work with the Air Force because the Air Force had very high intensity powerful dishes to really, you know, glare. So it's you know, if it's aimed in the right way, then you can you know, communicate. But if it's slightly off, you know, if you're in the wrong part of the grocery and your cell phone isn't getting the right kind of signal, yeah, you're doomed. But what the Air Force had was like, like a very concentrated, high power communication dish that they just happened to be able to point up and communicate with up in say sa- up in space. Yeah, so they were able to point it at it. I wonder what the they're. I wonder who they're normally communicating up in space with with this super high power dish. They just have higher intensity. I mean, for regular... I think they got some sort of fancy, cool space operation going up there that we don't know about, and it sounds like it's probably really cool, and we're getting left out. Getting left out? Yep. Okay, well, um, <laughs> you can have the big guys in black suits come to your door if you're assuming such things exist. Wait, no, you've seen that. Uh, there's that Air Force space shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. We've so seen they, that one. You know, they got you know, remote control. Maybe they talked to that thing with it. Yeah. But, I mean, for regular you know, spacecraft or satellites, if you don't have to have super powerful signal, then why build it? You know, if you can get away with using, you know, 10 volts or whatever, why yeah. go to 100? Yeah. You know, it's not that kind of actual power base, but that kind of a thing. Yeah. So they're able to use that more powerful to kind of directly beam it up to it. That uploaded the software they their solution actually got the valves un, unstuck they worked that's why the mission continued on they were actually able to hook it up to the space station and in the meantime they've gone back to the all the old check valves <laughs> good and they're going to be running tests on everything to on you know at various pressures to make sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen again very good all right well while we're up in space why don't we do a curiosity update and lift off of the Atlas V with Curiosity. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't uh, jumping up and down. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, no, Heather. Totally so not. now hold on. Hold on. Yes. There's nothing to talk about with Curiosity. There is. No, no. I, you, no, okay. No way. Impossible. Yes. There okay, is. What, is, what, what do we got? All righty. The first, there is the parachute. You know, so you had, you know, we talked about the rockets a few minutes ago and had a little jet pack. Yeah. But it came down and I had a parachute to help slow it down. Right. They were able to find, you know, where the, where the back shell and where the parachute is. And now they have this animation, uh, GIF animation of seven different images where they're actually able to kind of see where the parachute is sort of, quote unquote, flapping in the wind almost. Yeah, yeah. They acquired between... August of 2012 and January of 2013, they can actually see, you know, they're not, you're not looking out and seeing, you know, the flag wave, <laughs> but you're seeing where it's, it's laying in different positions over various time. So, you know, the wind is moving it around, probably kicking off dust. Now it would stay brighter because if it keeps flapping around in the wind, then it keeps the, you know, the brighter, you know, white, color to it it's knocking out off all the red dust right which would also ex- help explain why we can actually still see the parachute from the viking one that landed back in 1976 we can still tell where that is oh wow you know all the other things it starts to get tougher and tougher to see them because they get covered more and more and more you know dust from mars as it right. blows around in their sandstorms but these if they keep flapping in the wind then that would keep them sort of you know, knock the dust off them continuously. So they're able to see that. And also, they've, you know, they have some basic 
data going on that they'll continue to sort of, they sent up, you know, to-do lists, you know, last month for Curiosity because all the rovers and the, the orbiter, the sort of not getting any new commands this month because it's because of the or- orientation of Mars and Earth. The sun is in between us. So we don't mm-hmm. want to, you know, chance getting some lost data mm-hmm. telling it to do things. Now it will send back data because if it, you know, if it doesn't get all the data back, it's not super clear, then that's OK. We're going to get the backup. You know, it's keeping a copy of everything. Yeah, we can always ask ask it to resend. Yeah, we'll ask it to resend later. Yeah. But in the meantime, they have this sample analysis uh, SAM instrument that looks at the atmosphere. Oh, yeah? And they're actually able to see that, able to read the argon amounts in the air, in the Martian atmosphere. And they're able to see that they're, how much of these lighter stable isotopes compared to heavier ones. Now isotopes are the same element. They just have different atomic weights. Maybe there's um you know something slightly different. It has the same number of protons, same number of neutrons. Maybe there's an extra electron. You know, various things going on that make the weight just slightly different. Hmm. So you're able to see the ratio of these. And we know what the ratio is in just the regular, you know, atmosphere. Able to see the solar system's specific ratio by seeing the sun, by looking at Jupiter. So we can say, all right, that's the basic. Now, Mars has something different. It has a different ratio of these, mm-hmm. which says it had a more specific atmosphere. And there's this one theory that Mars had a much thicker atmosphere at one point. It had, you know, Earth thickness or, you know, much thicker atmosphere. And then the sun sort of boiled it away or kind of blew away with the sun's uh, solar wind. And this actually sort of proves that. These specific ratios say it would have had this type of specific atmosphere. It would have blown the top level level layers of that atmosphere away, which would lead to this specific ratio that we're actually seeing. Hmm. That kind of helps prove that. And also we'd seen the... The ratios in the uh, Viking mission we talked about a minute ago back in 1976. But that only had like small volumes of data. And because this instrument is so much, it is specifically looking for these. It has a much higher precision rate. We're able to kind of say, oh, okay. So we thought it was this in 76. And we kind of been working off that data. Now we have much more data and precision there to, to get this. And uh, also, they're in the same thing. They're taking uh, atmospheric re- measurements. They're able to say there are, you have these environmental monitoring stations. You can take the temperature, the, the humidity, a number of measurements. So they've been seeing the temperature kind of climb steadily over the last eight months or so. Now, it's not necessarily straightly dependent upon the rover's location. So they're kind of seeing winter climbing into summer. Now, the humidity in of itself has been changing as to where they are. They can see places where it's higher humidity, places where it's lower humidity. So it's more location specific. Would say, then you could see, you know, this area has specific chemicals in the, you know, in the, the ground where you are, and so that would have a different atmos- the you know, humidity level right above it. And they're able to see some of these whirlwind patterns during the first, you know, a uh, couple months of the mission, which, similar to Dust Devils, you know, we've seen the you know, Opportunity and Spirit rovers actually see like the dust levels tromping across the camera, <laughs> you know, yeah. and one of them ran right over one of the rovers <clears throat> and cleared off a lot of the dust from the solar panels. Right, gave it a little boost. Which, yeah, totally much of a boost. It was like thumbs up to the little, you know, dust devils. Now we haven't actually seen any of those specifically on um, curio- on Curiosity. Now, in the same amount of time, we saw them at you know, where Opportunity and Spirit were. So it may be more location specific. Those kind of things. 
We've seen but, some dust around Curiosity though when it did some drilling. Well, yes, but this is different. This is. I just want an excuse to show the picture. Okay, that's mm-hmm. that's a good. Okay, yeah, it's a good excuse to show the picture. <laughs> so we've seen it where it's kind of the wind was starting to swirl in the right way, but no actual you know proper dust devils. Right, not yet. Nope, not quite yet. So <laughs> for the rest of this month, it's going to continue its little daily runs of you know radiation assessment and tracking some of the checking more of the atmospheric data and sort of taking pictures because when May rolls around, they will actually be drinking, drilling into another rock. Another good reason to show the drilling, hmm. which they haven't decided on exactly where. They're sort of during this, um, you know, conjunction period when the sun is between Earth and Mars. They're kind of using this downtime to decide what rock they're going to actually drill into. So they're catching up on their data. They're looking at what's there kind of gathering everything up together. They made a couple announcements and also looking forward to in what are they going to do when they can actually send commands again. I bet. Well, and this is good. They're keeping it busy because that way yes. it doesn't come back home looking for its creator, right? <laughs> got to keep, keep it active. Keep it, keep keep it busy. Keep the thing going. All right, Heather, why don't you uh, jump in the time machine and uh, let's head back here. Here we go. All right. Thing working? I huh. think so. It's just not a far trip. Wow. I mean, it's we could have smooth. taken the Toyota to this destination. This only takes us to 13 years ago, uh, April 13th, the year 2000. What happened this week in science, Heather? The oldest mouse that ever lived was born on April 13th. And you will love his name. His name was Yoda. Oh, a mouse named Yoda. And he was the oldest mouse. He what does that to... mean, the oldest mouse? What does that mean? He lived a... Four years old. Okay, so that's which is, a long time. <laughs> yeah, compared to Earth years, it's like 136. All right, respect. So it was a little dwarf mouse. He lived with a you know a larger, uh, you know, cage mate. They called her Princess Princess Leia, so he could hang out with her wow. for body warmth and kind of have why, a pal. Why was he so old? What what was it about him? Did they have him they, on some sort of amazing regime of? Uh, Mousy vitamins? <laughs> <laughs> no, they have different strains of mice to look at different things. And this one was looking at geriatrics, so looking at the aging process and mm. genetics and cell biology. Now, this one specifically was, you know, they had wild mice captured in Idaho that sort of naturally live longer. They stay smaller. They kind of age more slowly than ordinary, you know, quote, quote unquote, ordinary mice. So they took these and then they kept, you know, breeding together the ones that lived the longest. They, you know, eventually you'll get these longer lived mice. Uh, Cobalt in the chat room. The average mouse, I believe, lives about two years. A little over two years or so, plus or minus six months. So the internet's like on mouse years. That's the, you know, like because <laughs> the internet moves so fast. Like I had no, I really had never thought about the lifespan of a mouse. Neither had I before I saw this. But I guess four years, if they're normal, average is two. That's, that's wow. That's pretty good. Yeah. That is pretty I mean, good. That's 136 in, in human years. That's, 136. That, that's getting there. Yeah. All right, let me retune the side by 2000 because it's time to look up into the sky this week. That is right. Wednesday, April the 10th, about 10 p.m. or later, the what they call the summer star. It's a vega. It's the second or third brightest star that you can see in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm. It's going to be rising in the Northeast. So there's a big bright star over there. A little after 10 p.m. That's actually not one of the planets. That is the star Vega. Also, you're going to have the new moon, so it's going to be very dark to be able to see a lot more of the sky going up. Uh-huh. On Saturday, you're going to be start to see the crescent moon. So there's going to be a little smiley face of the moon. Just a smile. About an hour after sunset on Saturday, you're going to be able to see the crescent moon in the west, and Jupiter is actually going to be to its upper left. Now, it's also going to kind of, later in the night, um, it's going to be, around that time, it's also, so Jupiter is to its upper left, sorry. And it's also going to lie in between the Pleiades star cluster. That's a whole bunch of stars like seven stars really close together. So it kind of looks like a little bit of a fuzz. You might be able to make out individual stars Hmm. if you have better eyesight than me. 
Um, so it, that's going to be to its right and slightly below to the moon. And uh, to its left and slightly up is going to be the giant red star Aldebaran. So Saturday, you got the crescent moon. Way to its upper left, you have Jupiter. And then either side of it, you have the Pleiades star cluster and the giant red star Aldebaran. In general, uh, the planets, we've got Saturn rising in the west to southeast about the end of twilight. Um, that made no sense. Um, and Jupiter, after sunset, you're going to be seeing it high in the western sky. And as the evening goes on, you're going to see it coming closer to the horizon. And at its, it's going to be at its highest point in the south. So it's going to be kind of moving across the sky a little bit. At about 2 a.m., daylight savings. So if you're actually observing daylight savings, then it'll be that time. 2 a.m. Um, okay, that's quite a busy sky, actually. Yeah. All right, so Heather has uh, that all broken down in the show notes. If you remember, she said something, and you see it up there. You want to go figure out what it is, just go find SciBite episode 89. Show notes are there. That the Towards the bottom of the notes, are, are all that is, is uh, listed out. But links to everything that Heather covered. Lots of more information. Videos that are embedded in the show notes. All kinds of stuff. You can read more over there. But Heather, I think that brings us to the end of this week's show, doesn't it? I think so. Wow. Well, there you go. Heck of a big show. Heck of a big show. Heather, yes. if people want to get a hold of you, how should they do it? They can get me at Twitter at JB underscore Mars underscore base. Boom. That's always a great way to do it. And, of course, we've got the contact form. You can go find it. Just hit the contact link at the top of our site. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for tuning in this week's episode of SciBite. And, Heather, thank you for the great show. Thank you. And thank you to our chat room who joined us live over at jblive.tv this Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week.